Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome all of you to the worship of God here at Westminster. We are glad you're here, and we welcome everyone to come join us for worship. At the end of the pew, you'll find a pew pad. If you could sign your name and pass it on, we'd appreciate it. And also, there are prayer request cards in the pew rack immediately in front of you. If you have a prayer request, uh, fill out the card and we'll pick those up as we sing our second hymn. Today is Flapjack Breakfast Sunday. That means pancakes are being prepared even as we speak and uh, we get to enjoy those uh, after church. So go have breakfast and we are taking an offering. If you'd care to contribute, we are, the funds go to the pastor's fund today, which is a fund that does good for other people, not just for the pastors. So that's <laughs> important, important to know. Um, are there announcements? The women of Westminster want to thank you all so very much for those who contributed the $37 to help with the buckets. I went out shopping, and this morning I put one thing in bucket number nine, four things in bucket number 10, and filled bucket number 11. So we met our goal and went over. We thank you so very, very, very much. Monday, Carolyn Werlein and June Tratt and I met, and Carolyn and I did the buckets while June and Carolyn did the kits. And so far we have 40, but we believe there are people that took these little plastic bags with a couple bandages in them home. And if you find one, will you please finish it and bring it back next Sunday? We had a goal of 50, so far we have 40. Let's see what we can do. Thank you so much. This is the season of Crop Walk. Crop Walk will be on October 14th um, in the afternoon. For those of you who don't know, Crop Walk is and always has been about food, about feeding hungry people. Uh, proceeds from Crop Walk go to food pantries, go to um, elderly feeding programs, and much of it stays right here in our community. Uh, right now, we are looking not only for donors for you to donate to Crop Walk, but also for people who are willing to walk. Um, and that means you just pick up a packet and ask your friends, neighbors, and people here in church to help donate to this worthy cause. Joel and Linda always sit at a table right outside. Um, if you'd like more information up and, or to donate or to walk, please stop by. Thanks. Let's stand up and greet one another.
please remain standing and join me in the call to worship. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, saying, Praise the Lord. be seated. The Apostle Paul invites us in the letter to the Romans into a stance of evaluation and confession when he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. We present ourselves to God for transformation by coming together in confession. Let us pray together the prayer of confession. Gracious God, we confess our reluctance to be transformed by the renewal of our hearts. We prefer the security of the familiar, even when it leads us to act in ways that are faithless and harmful. We resist your call to change, and we avoid knowing the truth of what we do and also the truth of what we fail to do. We erect barriers to your redeeming power within us, and we grieve your Holy Spirit by our resistance to the one who makes all things new. When called to support our sisters and brothers in moments of transformation, too often we turn away, failing to freely share the love so freely given to us. Forgive us and make us into disciples that follow as you lead us into new life. And all God's people say, The scriptures teach us that 
in Jesus Christ is the assurance that our sin is forgiven. Hear the teaching of Christ. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you.
Good morning. Thank you for coming up here. Um, does any one of you play sports in school or maybe during the summer? Baseball? Soccer? Basketball? Oh, you don't have to. <laughs> um, uh, it's too soon for basketball, but that's coming up pretty quick. Um, and before you play a game, you need to pick teams, right? <laughs> um, there's the assumption that the best people that are picked first are the best, and those who are picked last are not so good. But I'm not sure that's true. Um, in today's um, gospel story, the disciples are having an argument behind Jesus' back about who is the greatest. Maybe Peter and Andrew say they are the greatest because Jesus picked them first to be on his team. Or maybe all of them think they are Muhammad Ali. <laughs> they're awake. Uh, <laughs> in any case, they're having this argument. So Jesus says to them, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. You know, being first is a big responsibility. Uh, you end up being the support system for everyone else. Um, you, um, others look up to you to show them how to do something, to give them pointers about how to be better, uh, how to work as a team and um, good sportsmanship. But what about those that are chosen last? Um, they're just as important. Uh, maybe you can't throw the ball very far, but you can sure hit that ball over the fence every single time. And who wouldn't want someone like that on their team? Or maybe you can never get the basketball through the hoop, but you know someone who can and you get the ball to them. The first will be last and last will be first. That's key. Let's say a prayer together. Dear God, teach us to love, support, and serve one another. Help us to remember that everyone has value and something to contribute. All of us are the greatest. All of us are on the winning team. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you join with me in the prayer for illumination? O oh Lord, our God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31. A capable wife, who can find? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant, she brings her food from far away. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and tasks for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She guards herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. 
She is not afraid for her household when it snows, for all her household are clothed in crimson. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the city gates, taking his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchant with sashes. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy, her husband too, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the city gates. Our psalm response is Psalm 1. We'll sing it as hymn number 714, verses 1 through 4. Our New Testament reading comes first from the book of James. We read from chapter 3 into chapter 4. Hear the word of God. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? 
Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that scripture says God yearns jealously for the spirit he has made to dwell in us? But he gives all the more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. And then, <clears throat> then from the Gospel of Mark, we read from chapter 9. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and the servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The word of the Lord. If you have a prayer request, we ask that you hold it up so the ushers can collect it as we sing our next hymn. You may be seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, grant us your wisdom as we come to your word this day. Help us look at our lives and amend them. Help us look at our lives and see where your hand is at work. Help us look at our lives and see in the midst of them your great gifts of strength and love, of hope and of joy. As we receive your word, move us to be your faithful servants. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Yeah, it's allergy season. We'll see how long this thing goes. Um, Religion should be good for something, and it should make a difference to your life, and it should change who you are, and it should shape your key sources of joy. Today is the first day of a festival in Jewish tradition known as Sukkot, or the festival of the booze, or the tabernacles. And this was a pilgrimage festival that occurred after the grape harvest. And there was a great celebration of grapes that occurred during this festival. And you can kind of imagine how that worked out, that people maybe had a few extra glasses of wine. And also this festival was characterized by a number of religious rituals that involved uh, sort of reconnecting to their own faith and reminding them of the great source of their joy that occurred in their everyday lives. Um, I'm going to read just a little clip about Sukkot. And this is just one of the rituals that occurred every night during this festival that lasted a week long. Four very large menorahs, these were seven branch lamps of the shape that are still used to celebrate Hanukkah, were brought into the court of the women. This is on the Temple Mount. There was an inner court, there was a court of women, there was a court for Gentiles. The menorahs were so large that men had to climb ladders in order to fill the bowls of each menorah with oil. The priests used the cloth from their old robes and girdles to make wicks for their bowls. It said that the light from the menorahs was so bright that every courtyard in Jerusalem was lit up from the light. The visitors then filled the courtyards of the temple with the men, and in one of the court in the courtyard of the women, flute players provided dance music. The Levites would play their harps, drums, cymbals, and trumpets. See, I knew it was a holy instrument when I took it off. The men would perform a torch dance, dancing with flaming torches in their hands. The party lasted throughout the night and ended with the Levites singing the Psalm of Ascent. All these are psalms that are from 120 to 134. And um, they'd go through all these. And then everybody that was still awake would join a procession to go to the East Gate of Jerusalem and participate in the ceremony of the rising sun. One of the great traditional Jewish pieces of literature said, anyone who has not seen the rejoicing that takes place in the courtyard of the women in his life has never seen rejoicing. You know, we've lost that somehow. We, we ought to have more fun at church. Uh, the only time I've seen anybody play with fire was an accident with one of the pork chops. You know, and, and so this idea that great things can happen when we gather, that our religion should be a source of joy for our life, and that what was a religious pilgrimage was also a great vacation for the family. They got away, they camped out in tents, they drank a little too much and they danced all night long. How does that sound for religion? That sounds pretty good. And so it should matter to us and it should change us and it should leave a mark on us. That uh, passage we read from Proverbs that talks about this idealized woman that can seem to do everything from real estate transactions to spinning wool. And it is said that particularly devout Jewish men would read this to their wives every week <laughs> before the Sabbath. And I thought, what a, what a wonderful tradition of saying, in you, I see these very best things, these good gifts to life, and you embody those in some way for me. Religion ought to make a difference. 
And so in these very practical ways, have a vacation, have a party, tell your wife you love her, and do it in a way that's meaningful, and we're going to even give you words to do that. Religion ought to matter. And so that's where we get to the part of the disciples and where their religion doesn't seem to matter to them, but instead is a cause for dispute and pain and disappointment for them. Now, Jesus is trying to give them a truth. It's a truth about death and resurrection, and I think that truth is still one of the hardest ones for us to hear and to learn. That so many of the things that have been important to us throughout our life are actually things that should die. And they need to be reborn in a new way in us. If this business of not making distinctions among ourselves is not clearly a consuming human enterprise, let me invite you to come to a presbytery meeting and watch all the ministers talk about their churches. Because it is a way for them to set themselves apart and say, oh yes, well, it's great that you had 65 at Vacation Bible School, but our 93 was even better than yours. It's great that your church is this size, but you know, well, we worship. Whatever the number is, I always thought those guys inflated it. It's true. We make distinctions among ourselves. We want to be first. We want to be better. Um, there are places where competition makes a lot of sense. And competition can be fun. Uh, I remember uh, just watching our dean of students at the seminary play ping pong. This was a competitive man. But he put it in an outlet that made sense. And when it came time to listen to students and love students and care for students, he knew that wasn't a place to engage in one-upsmanship. It's hard for us not to make distinctions, to not want to put ourselves first, for us not to say, <clears throat> because of my education, because of my status in class, because of my income, because of my race, I should be better than you. Because of my preference for a sexual partner, I am better than you. And all of those things, Jesus says, are a mistake. Now that's hard to hear. And we should recognize that if our religion is going to matter to us, we should hear this hard thing. And hear that it's not about making distinctions, but it's about finding a place where we can find joy in service. And so he says, let's take the one that has the least status in society, and that would be children in the time of Jesus. There were certain traditions that said, yeah, that you don't really need to name the kids until they're five or six because you don't know if they're going to make it anyway. And you name them after relatives and you don't want to curse them by giving them the name of a child that doesn't survive. And so it was a culture that sometimes had nameless children running about. And Jesus says, this is where you ought to focus your attention. This ought to be what matters to you. Seize the chance to be of service. And when you've done that, you've started to find your way to a better life. Um, <clears throat> if you read old hymns, or even if you sing them, a lot of times you'll hear this phrase that talks about sin and misery. And it's a recognition that if we pursue a path of sin, we will bring grief back on ourselves. That misery 
is connected to sin. And what is more miserable than feeling like you always have to be better than somebody else? What is more miserable than saying, I have to acquire something more for me to be better? What's more miserable than saying, I get to look down on you for some arbitrary reason? There's no way, there's no way for that to be a source of joy and faith and life. And Jesus wants to nip it in the bud with his closest followers. Listen both to this hard thing that I have to say about dying and rising. And remember that the distinctions you make among yourselves are counterfeit. They don't help. And they're going to bring misery into your heart the very end. Um, a couple of random thoughts of stuff I read in recent Christian centuries, and then we'll call it good for today. Last summer, Ken Parker participated in the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. A former Grand Dragon of the KKK, he joined a Nazi group after concluding that the KKK wasn't hateful enough. His intention in going to the white supremacist rally was to start a race war. Over the past year, he had a change of heart through getting to know an African-American neighbor, William McKinnon III, pastor at All Saints Holiness Church in Jacksonville, Florida. Parker was recently baptized in McKinnon's mostly black church. Can you imagine how liberating it was to take that hate out of his heart? Just imagine how good that felt and how good it can feel for us to abandon those distinctions we are so wedded to and seek instead that joy that comes in faithful service. All right. One more clip. A room full of despairing theologians, <clears throat> a room full of despairing theologians asked social philosopher Rene Girard, what should be done in our apocalyptic times? We might begin with personal sanctity, he said. This was a typical Girardian comment, observed Christopher Shin. It was modest, yet grandly challenging. The most important thing we can do in the face of catastrophe is to look at ourselves try to understand our own violence and become better. Could anything be simpler or more difficult? Let us stand and affirm our faith using the affirmation found in our bulletins. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in one body of Christ, the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the water of the baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. 
in a broken and fearful world. The Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. You may be seated. We have these uh, prayer requests for today. Um, there is prayer is asked for someone named Rachel for their anxiety to be healed and for appropriate medical help to be sought in the meantime. Um, and then this statement that we have learned that Eric Gabriel, our longtime snow removal contractor, is being treated for a severe cancer tumor in Swedish American in Rockford. We pray for Eric, his wife, and their two young girls. There's a prayer request for the Malhotra family. This is Anna Corbine's boyfriend's uh, family. Uh, Rishi, her boyfriend, went home to India to be with his family after a serious car accident. Prayer for healing and for Rishi's safe travel. There's a prayer request for the Sherman family and the loss of text. And also prayers are asked for the people of Yemen and Syria. With these concerns in mind, let us come to God in prayer. Gracious God, we pray for your church in every place. May we worship and serve you faithfully. Avoid distinctions among ourselves and cling to the promise that your faith can matter to our lives and be a deep source of joy. We pray for leaders and people in every land that they may know your way and do your will. We especially think of those areas torn by war and strife for places where persecution is openly practiced, where death seems to follow in the government's quest for power. Help us be people that seek justice and peace. We pray for the earth you have made that it may flourish in beauty and show your glory. We pray that we take care of it in ways that preserve it for future generations and allow us to enjoy its abundance. For all those who hunger and thirst, we pray that they may be filled with good things and our eyes may be open to ways to help. For those who are ill or close to death, that they may receive your loving care. Hear us, gracious God, as we lift those concerns dear to our hearts to you now. Now, as our Savior has taught us, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
let us offer our gifts to God. Let us pray. O most merciful and gracious God, from whose open hand we have all received much, we ask you to accept this offering of your people. Remember in your love those who have brought it. Remember also those persons and purposes for which it is given. So follow this sacrifice with your blessing that it may promote peace and goodwill and advance the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. God has shown you what is good and what does the Lord require of you? 
but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And now may the Lord bless and keep you in your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen.